Good afternoon. Good afternoon. It's so nice to see everyone here. Welcome to the Bowdoin College Museum of Art. I'm Anne Collins Goodyear, and together with my husband, Frank Goodyear, I have the pleasure of co-directing the museum. We're glad that you can join us for our ongoing programming offered in connection with This is a Portrait If I Say So, Identity in American Art, 1912 to Today. Your support is critical for all we do for the museum. We offer a special thank you to our members. And if you have not yet had a chance to do so, we urge you to consider joining the museum. Membership is free and allows us to keep you posted about opportunities and special events. You can join by completing cards available here in the museum shop or by going online. We welcome your feedback as well on a special survey which has been distributed today, which can be returned either to a BCMA staff member at the conclusion of our lecture or to our gift shop. And you'll see there's a special incentive to complete it at the gift shop. We also want to express our deep appreciation to the sponsors whose generous support has made possible our exhibition and related programming. We thank the Henry Luce Foundation, the Smithsonian Institution, Eric and Svetlana Silverman, Ed and Carolyn Hyman, the Becker Fund for the Bowdoin College Museum of Art, the Elizabeth B.G. Hamlin Fund, the Devon Wood Foundation, Hallie K. Harrisburg and Michael Rosenfeld, Mary and John McGoigan, Thomas and Hannah McKinley, the Stevens L. Frost Endowment Fund, Mary O'Connell and Peter Grua, an anonymous donor, the Chappelle Family Art Fund, and the Roy A. Hunt Foundation. This afternoon, it brings me great pleasure to introduce Richard Saunders, director of the Middlebury College Museum of Art and Walter Cerf Distinguished College Professor at Middlebury College. It is particularly special to have Rick here, given his own personal ties to Bowdoin as an alumnus, a member of the class of 1970. Following Bowdoin, Rick earned his master's degree at the University of Delaware in the Winterthur program in early American culture, and then went on to complete his PhD at Yale University. Rick is a highly regarded expert in American art and in the history of the museum. He has curated numerous exhibitions and has published widely, including projects and dedicated volumes on the work of Horatio Greenow, John Smybert, and colonial American portraiture. As is evident from his area of expertise, his research has included work on Bowdoin's own collections, and he was indeed generous enough to contribute a superb essay on James Bowdoin III, Bowdoin's founder and a pioneering American art collector, to Catherine Watson's important collection, The Legacy of James Bowdoin III. We also deeply appreciate the support Rick has extended to the museum's recent publication of an online catalog on James Bowdoin III's drawings collection, the first such public collection in the United States. My own introduction to Rick, who has been an exceptionally generous colleague, was through our mutual interest in the development of American portraiture. And we are delighted that he can join us on the occasion of This is a Portrait If I Say So, particularly given his own publication of an important new study, American Faces, A Cultural History of Portraiture and Identity, which has just appeared with the University Press of New England. An accompanying exhibition is planned for, Middlebury for the Middlebury College Museum of Art next spring. It is something I know we will all enjoy seeing. Rick is therefore uniquely qualified to offer this particular presentation, some additional observations on identity in American art. Please join me in welcoming Rick Saunders. 
Following his talk, Rick has graciously agreed to take questions from the audience. Rick, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you, Anne, for that incredibly generous introduction. I wish my wife were here to, uh, to hear that. So, um, I'm, First, let me say how delighted I am to be back at Bowdoin. It's one of my favorite places, and I'm not telling you something you don't already know, and that we're all very fortunate to be here. What I've been asked to do today is to share with you some of my observations about identity in American art in particular as they may help to inform the strain of portraiture in the museum's really remarkable exhibition, This is a Portrait If I Say So. What I'd like to do for the next few minutes is to say a bit about the galaxy of American portraits into which modern abstract portraits fit. So let's begin at the beginning. I've been looking at and thinking about portraits for many years. In fact, my introduction to portraiture occurred here as an undergraduate next door in the museum, looking at the wonderful collection of colonial and federal portraits that the college owns. What's changed for me, however, is how I look at, think, and write about portraits. What has interested me in particular for the past decade or so is not so much art historical issues, such as the lives of individual painters, sculptors, or photographers, or the important matters of style, attribution, and date, but rather the larger issue of why Americans have created portraits of themselves for so many years, in so many forms, and in such astonishing numbers. As a consequence, in recent years, I've become somewhat less focused on the art historical dots that portraits connect, but rather what all these portraits tell us about American culture and society over several centuries. <clears throat> I remember many years ago when I was a young scholar, and I was, when you're young and you know, you're in a graduate program and you're full of enthusiasm for what you do and you think everyone should be very referential, um, I, I found myself occasionally in a social setting where someone might casually ask me, well, what do you do or what's your field of interest? And often I said with enormous enthusiasm, well, I was studying, I was studying portraits. And there'd be this blank look that would immediately come over the face of the person asking the question. They'd be looking off a little bit. And this, did, this happened more than once. So I began to reflect on what actually that meant. You know, what image came into the mind of the person who was now questioning me about what I did? And invariably, I came back to portraits like this one, an elderly man wearing a dark suit, a serious expression, and housed in an elaborate gold frame. And can you blame them? I mean, if this is what we all spend our lives doing, I don't think there would be a lot of the appreciation we get from other things. So as I began to think about this a bit more, I realized that there are indeed lots of paintings like this on display all across America. And let's be honest, individually they hold little interest for us unless they depict a relative or someone historically notable. They may be competently painted, as this picture is. This is the portrait of Stephen Salisbury from Worcester, Mass, and painted by Daniel Huntington, um, who's probably the most successful society painter of the 19th century who is largely forgotten today. But to most viewers today, they're not particularly memorable images. In fact, I doubt that tomorrow anyone here will recall this man. So what interested me initially and what has interested most scholars over the past two centuries is not portraits like this, but rather the exceptional portrait, the portrait in which the artist captures something distinctive or surrounds the sitter with memorable attributes or setting. In reality, what much of the history of portraiture in America has been about has reflected an interest in the most compelling works produced by artists at different moments in time. Specifically, artists of national or international consequence and paintings that are so striking that they're relatively easy to recall. To be sure, 
There are very good reasons why the history of documenting and discussing the history of portraiture in America culture has focused on the exceptional. As in other aspects of life in America, it tends to be those unusually compelling images that capture our attention. But while I share the admiration for these kinds of images, and that is formal portraits, um, such as Gilbert Stuart's remarkable portraits of James Madison and Thomas Jefferson right here at Bowdoin, or Rufus Hathaway's unforgettable 1790 portrait of Molly Wales Forbes, grasping the artistic importance of these works is different from understanding how to make sense of the larger phenomenon that created them. So let me take a few minutes to explain what I've been doing and thinking about over the past decade. The question I asked myself was, is there a way to take the various types of portraits in America, regardless of their aesthetic quality, and place them within a meaningful structure that will enable us to comprehend what prompted their being made in the first place? After much additional looking at pictures and testing ideas and a two, literally two-year false start, I came to the conclusion that although it might turn out to be a fool's errand, it just might be possible to take the first step towards creating a rudimentary taxonomy of American portraits. Setting aside for a moment the sometimes contentious discussion of what actually defines a portrait, I wanted to see if I could place in meaningful groups all of the various images that surround us. Actually, the definition of a portrait that <clears throat> Dorinda Evans, in her catalog essay, that she used is probably as good as any, a representation of a specific person. And what I began, began to, what I began to understand is that all portraits, no matter how seemingly inconsequential, are created for specific reasons. There are, in fact, no accidental portraits. What I immediately realized was that many of our most cherished portraits, oil paintings on canvas, and to a far lesser degree, sculpted portraits, had much in common. These portraits, such as John Singleton Copley's 1767 portrait of the urbane Bostonian, Nicholas Boylston, are part of a very distinctive class. We hear a lot about the one percenters today. Well, Nic Nicholas Boylston was a one percenter. As only about 1% of colonial Americans could afford the luxury of owning a painted portrait. And these were private commissions. These were portraits intended exclusively for display in one's home. They're what I like to call society portraits because only the wealthiest of Americans could afford them. Society portraits have always largely been about four things, wealth, fashion, status, and likeness, both real and ideal. Here, in this little known but charming portrait of the Ernst Fiedler family in their New York home, tells us much about what society portraits are supposed to be. This image says, these folks are wealthy, they're fashionably dressed, and they live in a stylish cosmopolitan home. They're also handsome and very likely of significant social status in New York society. They are the epitome of success. Images such as this were displayed prominently in the home as affirmation of all these important aspects of their identity. Society portraits continued to be produced in enormous number until the 1920s, and they have slipped in and out of fashion ever since. They still exist today, but they now live a bifurcated existence in which some conservative artists and sitters adhere to age-old mimetic models, such as James Child's 1991 portrait, this is 1991, of Christopher Kit Forbes of the Forbes Magazine Fortune, or, brace yourselves, indeed, it exists in Palm Beach. You can watch a video about it, and there's a, there's a whole story with that left hand, which I'm not going to go into. Um, this is a 1999 portrait of Donald Trump by Ralph Cowan. These portraits stand in stark contrast to those commissioned by adventurous clients like billionaire Peter Brandt, who see cutting-edge portraits such as Maurizio Catalan's portrait of Stephanie. 
The difference is not just in style and appearance. In the Forbes and Trump portraits, the sitter had considerable say in the outcome, while in this portrait of the former model, Stephanie Brandt, Peter Brandt's wife, the client had to cede decision-making to the artist. So even today, society portraits exist in considerable number, and what continues to define them as a group is that they are private commissions by wealthy Americans or people who aspire to such wealth. Until the 1840s, this class of pictures, society portraits, remained the dominant form of portraiture in America. The only widespread, inexpensive alternative for the less wealthy was the silhouette, which was churned out in vast numbers across America. Charles Wilson Peale stated in 1803, alone, 8,800 silhouettes were cut at his Philadelphia Museum for one penny each. But as visually appealing as silhouettes are, they only reveal so much about the physical appearance of a person, and they could not possibly rival painted and sculpted portraits. In the aftermath of the invention of photography in 1839, however, portraiture in America experienced a sea change. Within a few years, it was possible for virtually anyone with a few dollars to purchase daguerreotypes, ambrotypes, tintypes, and cartes de visite. While the impact on the first tier of painters in America was negligible, photography was said by some to have killed miniature painting, images such as this that often cost as much as life-size portraits. But in 1857, Rembrandt Peale remarked to the contrary, photography had only killed bad miniature painting. And there certainly are examples of itinerant painters who set down their paints and brushes and replaced them with cameras. In fact, I believe that this, the narrative of being told in this picture, Thomas LeClaire's marvelous 1865 picture, Interior with Portraits, tells that story. Here we can see two children standing uneasily and stiffly before an artificial landscape background. As the photographer, seen from behind on the right, adjusts his camera. Upon closer examination, it becomes clear that this photographer's studio had previously served as a painter's studio, as evidenced by the plaster casts in the background, the painting of an elderly man on the easel, just in front of the photographer. An upholstered chair on the left, a hat, a cane, and a newspaper all suggest that someone who might otherwise be found in the painter's studio has departed and the agitated dog on the left in the back is a figure that signals alarm and suggests that change is afoot. The painting implies that the proprietor of the studio, once a portrait painter, has abandoned his increasingly marginalized career for that of the rapidly expanding profession of a studio photographer. One barometer of the declining popularity of the painted society portrait is provided by the exhibition statistics of the annual New York exhibition at the National Academy of Design. By the 1920s, if you look at that graph on the right, I don't know whether you can actually see that clearly. Um, by the 1920s, fewer than one in five pictures exhibited was a portrait where previously, in 1830, 60% of the pictures at the National Academy were portraits. Now, many factors contributed to this change, including the increasing cosmopolitan character of wealthy Americans in the years following the Civil War, as well as a rapidly expanding market for other forms of painting, such as landscapes and genre scenes. Simultaneously with this decline in the painted and sculpted portrait is the explosion of photography, the emergence of the amateur photographer made possible by the invention of the handheld box camera invented in 1888 by George Eastman, the development of increasingly inexpensive film, and by the early 20th century, the emergence of the snapshot as an important portrait format. We also know that such technological changes have continued right up until today. In the past decade alone, for example, advances in the smartphone and our appetite for selfies has made us all portraitists. We can even document the exact date, December 13th, 
2013, when the selfie officially arrived in mainstream America, when President Obama participated in a group selfie at Nelson Mandela's memorial service. So now portraits get taken everywhere. Here's the most famous selfie of all time so far, thanks to Samsung and the Academy Awards. This was the Ellen DeGeneres image, which you probably all know. Um, but on occasion, at the other end of the spectrum, selfies are not taken for the best reasons. Not only did a series of ill-conceived selfies lead to the demise of Congressman Anthony Weiner of New York, but other selfies taken to document our presence at a newsworthy event, perhaps in retrospect, seem to be callous and insensitive. As revolutionary as selfies may seem, in many ways, they are but one manifestation of what began as the snapshot phenomenon in America over a century ago. This becomes more apparent when we examine individual selfies and the motivations behind them. In fact, we take these images for many of the very same reasons we've done so for years, and they reveal a great deal about our social values. For example, we take holiday selfies that shout, look at our beautiful family, meaning happy, healthy, and normal, um, that recall a long history of photo snapshot prototypes. And this is because procreation and the family unit continue to be goals for many Americans, despite the suggestion that the idea of the stable nuclear family is increasingly less common than one might think. We also take I1 selfies. I just got to the top of this uh, telephone tower illegally, and I need to record that. And that's not all that different from Theodore Roosevelt show, show, showing that he won in his own field of conquest. We take I made it selfies that record important societal markers as well as I am somebody selfies that suggest though we may not be leaders or celebrities ourselves, we have had contact with such people. And you don't need to look any further than the proliferation of endless selfies uh, that we've seen at the Trump and Clinton campaign rallies. We take I belong group selfies that extend beyond any familial relationships. In these, we may be surrounded by classmates from Bowdoin, uh, business friends, uh, affiliates of our own uh, church or synagogue, members of the military, politi or political or social organizations, or um, friends at the Harvard-Yale game. And we take I exist selfies that just serve to share our most banal experiences with friends and family. In one mode of these, dubbed Arties, in a recent, journal in, a recent article in the Journal of the Psychology of Aesthetics, we use the background of an acclaimed work of art in a museum to document our presence. Ironically, rather than taking much time at all to look at the work of art itself. Uh, the, the journal article goes on to point out that the average visitor to the museum, Anne and Frank know this very well, spend no more than 28 seconds looking at a work of art, usually reading the text if there's a good extended text, glancing at the work and then pushing on. So uh, it's a challenge, but um, this is, this is a, the most recent challenge, I think, for some of us. And these selfies, like so many pho photographic portraits from earlier times, enhance our sense of self within a specific community. While each is an affirmation of who we are or who we wish to be, an important aspect of this feeling is because we are connected and are part of the modern world. In many ways, these images have taken, place, taken the place of film snapshots, as well as handwritten letters and diaries as a way of recording the paths of our personal histories and social development. Now, individually, most of these images, selfies and related snapshots, are not particularly memorable or meaningful. Rather, I think that it's in the enormity of their creation that we can learn a great deal about ourselves, our values, and our place in society. Another portrait class, of port another important class of portraits in America are those that depict the famous. And, and this is a category of portraits that has undergone an enormous transformation over the past 200 years. 
Formally, portraits of the famous were dominated by people who personified abstract ideals such as liberty, patriotism, valor, or high moral action. George Washington was the first figure of national importance to achieve this status. Um, there's no more sacred place in America for your portrait to be done than in the dome of the Capitol, surrounded by angels. So that's George Washington at the, right there. Um, and only decades after Abraham Lincoln's death, as wounds of our Civil War began to heal, did he join Washington as a national icon. In addition, any number of regional or local citizens have been cast as heroes or exemplars, model people. Uh, a good example is William Penn. This is the statue that's on top of the Philadelphia City Hall, and this is before it was raised to, the, um, to its pinnacle. Um, but for many years now, these images have been overwhelmed by a sea of celebrity portraits most recently in the form of celebrity selfies. Celebrities today are people who lead public lives, are well known for their accomplishments or of interest to the public, actively seek to maintain their status of being well known, are highly visible in the media, and connect to us on a subconscious level. Images of them serve as a vehicle for social bonding with fans and supply content to celebrity and entertainment news. In so doing, the dissemination of selfies serves to sustain celebrity capital and continuous branding. Their appeal to followers is that they exhibit the allure of a desirable career, a fit and styled body, and an enviable life of consumption. Through a constant, I love them, I love them obviously, through, through a constant distribution of different selfies, they also give the illusion of a level of intimacy not available elsewhere and in a sense of seeing someone's life unfold. So to these three species of portraits, society portraits for the wealthy, portraits that the rest of us can afford, and portraits that depict the famous or celebrated, I would add a fourth class, and that's portraits used to sell us something. These are propaganda portraits, and I, propaganda is a word that has an enormously unfavorable term in, uh, in American society, but I, I mean it somewhat more neutral than it's, it's normally used, in that propaganda is, when you use propaganda, it's, you have a goal in mind. You're trying to accomplish your specific goal and connect to an audience. But let me show you some examples. For example, in, on May 1st, 2003, the aircraft carrier Abraham Lincoln was in a few miles of the California coast, having just returned from the Middle East. President George Bush made a point to fly out to the ship and there to deliver an address on the flight deck. Although the spin that surrounded this image when it was released implied that it was a spontaneous celebration to, of the end to major combat in the Iraq war, Every detail of this event was scripted from beginning to end. It was a propaganda portrait of enormous hubris, and it haunted the remainder of the Bush presidency. But such efforts to craft portraits to influence how we think or act are not new at all. As far back as the election of 1860, the photographer Matthew Brady manipulated his photographic image of Abraham Lincoln for this gem tintype for the political campaign for this button, the first photographic button that exists. And the way he did this was by raising Lincoln's shirt collar to cover his long neck and by retouching his hair and face to make him appear less gaunt. So Photoshop is really not all that new. Today, portraits are used to sell us any number of products from the American Express card, thanks to Tina Fey, um, to where we should go to buy great art. Should we go to Sotheby's or should we go to Christie's? These latter portraits are intended to build client trust and subconsciously to add a human dimension to otherwise abstract business transactions. So then what are we to make of the portraits that populate public spaces across the country? 
whether it's here in Brunswick, where Joshua Chamberlain vigilantly guards the entrance to the Bowdoin campus, or a college campus in North Carolina, where Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. invites you to sit down and join him in his quest for equality, or along Interstate 45 near Huntsville, Texas, where you can wave to an almost 70-foot-high steel and concrete statue of Sam Houston on your drive across the flatlands of East Texas. Our landscape today is dotted with an ever-increasing multitude of these public portraits. We might ask ourselves, what are the messages that all these portraits have been created to deliver? If we dig a little, we discover, and this shouldn't be any surprise to anyone, that these monuments always reflect the values and agendas of those people who create them. As John Bodner has written, leaders share a common interest in social unity, the continuity of existing institutions, and the loyalty to the status quo. Monuments seen as these have been used to define public spaces, as well as add grandeur and signal cultural maturity. And those in power utilize public portraits and monuments in general out of a heightened anxiety about who and what should be remembered in America and to control particular narratives about the nation and its publics. So before we turn our attention to the abstract portraits that comprise one important element in our periodic table of national portraiture, I want to consider one additional aspect of portraiture in America. And that is the question, what happens then we, when we bring portraits together in groups? We've done this since colonial days, uh, first in private homes like this plantation house in Virginia, and then later in publicly accessible spaces such as the Peel Museum in Philadelphia. And when gathered together, these images have a different impact. In the case of the Peel Museum, the 200 portraits that he gathered there in a two-tiered frieze up, you can see it on the upper left of the watercolor here, of revolutionary era notables offered civic lessons on the founding of the Republic and implied that good character was not only accessible to all, but also could lead to good deeds in the surface of society. Similar motivations inspired the creation of Statuary Hall in the U.S. Capitol, where beginning in 1870, sculptures of illustrious citizens, all men, all white men, from each of the states have been displayed, or the Hall of, Hall of Fame of Great Americans in the Bronx, which actually was a little less gender specific. There are a few women in the Hall of Great Americans. This was on the New York University campus in the Bronx, New York. That's still there. And one can be forgiven for thinking that in our technology-obsessed world of today, that the oil-on-canvas portrait might be an endangered species. To the contrary, it thrives, in particular in the last bastion of convention-bound portraits, our institutional portraits collection. As the art historian and critic Robert Rosenblum once said, when confronted with the prospects of eternity in depicting a great man of state, most official painters rattle around in the graveyard of tradition. What he meant is that despite the enormous variety of technology-driven portraits that exist today, such as, just to give you two examples, video, this is a Tony Orsler self-portrait. Um, he uses videos, that's, that's a video of his face there in this larger sculpture, or holograms, um, this is actually a hologram that we commissioned at Middlebury of the president there. Um, institutional collectors such as corporate offices, this is, these are just random selections, New York Times, this is, this is, these are the portraits in the New York Times boardroom, Court of Appeals in New York, uh, Redwood Library in Athenaeum, uh, Harvard Club, Yale Club is exactly the same way as this, um, that they're all filled with portraits that all resemble each other. So what's going on here? It's that institutions prefer to acquire portraits that complement rather than compete with what's already there. And that's why at colleges like Middlebury and Bowdoin, official portraits tend to follow important but predictable conventions and be gathered in campus locations that have sufficient gravitas. 
such as the second floor of Hubbard Hall here at Bowdoin or uh, in Middlebury in the boardroom, the Board of Trustees room in our main administration building, um, where the portraits hang in the boardroom and give an added institutional weight to the decisions that are being made there. Um, here's Middlebury's latest contribution to that lineage. It looks an awful lot like a Copley portrait. I, I take responsibility for having commissioned this, so I, I'm telling you um, that I've been involved in, in continuing these traditions. And we know uh, right here at Bowdoin, this is the port recent portrait of President Barry Mills. And uh, there are more similarities than differences to all the portraits that have come before them. That's, that's basically my point. So with all these various groups of American portraits as background, what are we to make of the rise of abstract portraits in the 20th century? And what do these portraits, portraits without faces, as they've sometimes been called, tell us about the evolution of portraiture over the past 100 years? One immediate observation is that, somewhat surprisingly, it has taken until now that this and this extraordinary exhibit at Bowdoin for the richness and variety of these portraits to be recognized and gathered, and gathered together. This is a terribly important exhibit, and it's a great credit to Bowdoin and its curators, as it has been rightfully acknowledged by scholars as a major achievement. But that begs the question, just why has it taken so long for these images to receive the recognition they deserve? I think that the answer lies somewhere in how portraits by avant-garde artists have been regarded over the past century. And by this I mean that for some of these artists, as provocative and revealing as their portrait creations are, that portraits in some cases were not necessarily central to the individual artist's larger body of work. For example, Kathleen Campagnolo points out in her catalog essay that, quote, almost without fail, the non-mimetic portraits of the 1960s were made by artists for whom portraiture was not a significant part of their oeuvres. And even artists who created mimetic portraits, such as Chuck Close, whose work of art at times has been described as photorealist, reveal some time ago that, quote, it took me de decades to admit that I was making portraits. It's very hard when you're inoculated with the modernist virus. Clearly, many avant-garde artists who have created portraits over the past century struggled with how to describe their work in an era when the concept of mimetic portraiture was so uncool and critics and collectors were challenged to accept them. Another observation I would make is that my guess is that many of the images in the Bowdoin exhibit were not commissions, but rather were created for personal and sometimes private use, or as works of art to be exchanged with fellow artists, or in more recent years to be sold independently in the marketplace. In other words, these abstract portraits were not made to meet the conditions that govern the creation of many of the other types of portraits that comprise American portraiture prior to 1900. In fact, the rise of the abstract portrait coincides with enormous changes in the American art market. Historically speaking, the vast majority of portraits created in the 19th century were made as commissions. There are exceptions, of course, but artists who sought careers as portraitists more often than not, had to contend with the wishes of clients. As Dorinda Evans makes clear in her catalog essay, the lack of a need to satisfy a specific client, as in the case of James McNeil Whistler's portrait, Arrangement in Gray and Black Number 1, and its hints of abstraction with its flattened space and its emphasis on geometry, helps to under underscore the exceptional nature of this work and the freedom that accompanies independence. And as pointed out by Anne Goodyear in her catalog entry on Marcel Duchamp, contemporaries of Duchamp viewed his Boite en Valise as a new kind of autobiography. And this is not the work in the exhibit, Anne. This, I, this is a slightly different one. So perhaps we should see as a precursor of this imaginative examination of one's life, the painting, The Vanity of the Artist's Dream, painted almost 100 years earlier by the artist Charles Bird King. This work has been described as fiction based on fact, as it presents itself as the autobiography of an impoverished painter. 
In this broken cupboard crammed with possessions, all signs point to an artist abandoned by fortune and doomed to live in a country, the United States, so lacking in taste for the arts. Others have noted that King, who did apparently have, a, did paint this as a commission for his patron, soon after abandoned his interest in trompe l'oeil still life like this for a more prosaic but sure road to success in mimetic portraiture. Similarly, artists like William Harnett produced a form of symbolic portraiture with such Im images as Mr. Hewling's rack picture of 1888. Uh, and you can't read the envelopes and cards on this, on this board, uh, but there is a lot of information there. The painting was created for a Philadelphia dry goods merchant, Mr. Hewling's, and all of the names identified on the cards and envelopes help to provide a biographical sketch of him. Rather than being addressed to business associates, however, they are fellow congregants of the Wharton Street Methodist Episcopal Church in Philadelphia, along with fellow members of Hewling's Masonic Lodge. And two letters are for, from former Union soldiers. So while the entire biographical narrative remains elusive, it points to the panel serving as a symbolic portrait. The absence of a client also helps to explain the experimental nature and appeal to modern eyes of other landmark portraits in American history, such as Thomas Aiken's The Gross Clinic and Grant Wood's American Gothic. In each instance, the artist retained complete control of the outcome and had to satisfy no one other than himself. So, in considering the portraits that comprise the Bowdoin exhibit, it is worth keeping in mind that the exceptional variety and invention shown here was possible because the artists evaded the shackles of commissions. I also wonder what the original critical response was to many of the earlier portraits in the exhibit, those that date before 1975, when they were first, when they were, when they were first shared with the public. We know, for example, that Charles DeMuth's poster portraits um, Rep represented as a group by his most famous one, I saw the figure five in gold, um, which was not made until 1928, but earlier he had exhibited uh, his earlier poster portraits in an important exhibit called Seven Americans. And uh, there was generally a negative response uh, to this group of, of pictures. We do know that after, not surprisingly, it's just a commentary about that's the way, that's the way it was. We do, not, we do know that after World War II and the rise of abstract expressionism, that the oil on canvas portrait, painted portrait, had become virtually irrelevant to contemporary art, the contemporary art world. In 1977, Marvin Sadik, then director of the National Portrait Gallery in Washington, but previously director here at Bowdoin, noted somewhat despondently, we live in a time in which, because of the ubiquitous photograph, and the fact that our art academies have moved in directions other than representationalism, it might also be said that the bottom has fallen out of the nadir of portraiture. Further, we know that this, the long, slow rehabilitation of portraiture, abstract or otherwise, began in 1963, when Andy Warhol accepted a portrait commission from Ethel Skull, and the result, Ethel Skull, 36 times, revolutionized the contemporary portrait market and the portrait, and portraits in general, and made possible over the next decade the return of the portrait from its banishment by critics to the outer orbit of the art world galaxy. But change did not happen overnight, and I think that probably the next key date in the portrait's return to acceptance was in 1975, when Art in America devoted its entire January-February issue to contemporary portraiture. My guess is that it is only after this date was there a newfound appreciation for and awareness of what had been lurking in the shadows for years, the work of those artists who dared to call anything a portrait, abstract or not. And I would speculate that it was probably about this time that museum curators and scholars began to look more closely at 20th century artists to see whether they had explored their own kinds of experimental portraits during years when it was most unfashionable to do so, and the results were likely to have never been sold or exhibited. 
But as the Bowdoin exhibit makes clear, we've come to realize that portraiture has become increasingly as much a vehicle for describing identity as it is for rendering appearance. In addition, recent years have exploded the myth that portraiture might be able to capture a unified self. And lastly, we have come to realize that identity is not fixed, but in flux, and that any image can only possibly contribute a small fragment of a much larger and complex narrative. I'd like to leave you with one last thought. I'm as intrigued as the organizers of this exhibit to know the answer to the question, what comes next? And just how will contemporary portraiture in all its myriad forms inform, describe, and reflect American society in the future? What is unavoidable, however, is the fact that we're in an era of tremendous social and technological change that will continue to fuel the experimentation and cross-pollination that many of the works in this exhibit represent. And this exhibit provides us with some provocative clues about the future and, and each relies on data collection. For example, Sarah Z, and these works are small and even hard to read when in the exhibit you have to get up close and really examine them. So I'm not doing her any service by showing this image, but it's, a, it's an important work. And she reminds us that the narrative tradition in portraiture continues to provide inspiration for artists. This 2009 work, Portrait of JS, is a sheer delight. It's created using only pencil and paper, and she's created a lyrical meandering map after asking the sitter to write down 12 significant events in his or her life. The result propels the viewer into a multi-layered world of overlapping and borderless vignettes. Equally compelling is Jason Salavon's use of Google searches and arrays of data arranged in fluctuating squares of color in works such as Spigot, Babbling Self-Portrait. As Anne notes about Salavon, he suggests that our identity is both reflected and shaped by our interaction with virtual environments. And finally, one disturbing aspect of the modern world, actually this one deals with it as well, and that's about surveillance and doc tracking information about people. Um, but the issue of constant surveillance has been turned on its head in Hassan Alahi's work, Tracking Transience. Here in a series begun in 2003, the artist has utilized digital pictorial recording to track his location and activities on an ongoing basis. The result is a body of sheer data at once both numbing and reassuring as he assembled, has assembled this data in patterns and rhythms that remind us that much of life is a repetitive act. What remains to be seen is how these and numerous other mimetic and non-mimetic images will engage future Americans. Although our combative and polarized society at present may make many of us uneasy, we know that turbulent moments in our history have provided fertile ground for social change and artistic revelation. My guess is that the artists interested in the broader social issues that serve to shape American identity will capitalize on this moment as well. Time will tell. Thank you. Hi, Richard. Um, <clears throat> I'm interested in the pictures of people taking the selfies. They seem to be a phenomenon as well. Can you elaborate on that? Or so the photographs of people taking selfies. People taking photographs of people taking selfies? Right, right. <laughs> well, I, 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 think it's, I think it's, you know, when you, you 
It's hard to know exactly because uh, I don't have the figures with me, but the, uh, the, the, the number of, I think I saw uh, um, a quotation that every two minutes um, more images are uploaded to Snapchat than in all, all the images that were produced in America in the 19th century. I mean, the figures are enormous. And uh, when we select, as I did for today, when I selected, because I was trying to present specific arguments and document certain things that I think are happening, when I selected these images, or if, if anyone did the same thing, you don't know um, actually whether you're being fair and represented to what's actually happening out there. There is a website called Selfie City, um, which is a, it's a documentary project funded by a major, a major philanthropic organization um, that took five cities around the world, uh, New York, uh, a couple cities in Europe, uh, a couple cities in Asia, and one in South America, and they took 3,200 selfies, and they're doing data analysis on those selfies. Uh, everything from men versus women, uh, age, uh, how the person projects themselves, uh, whether they're higher or lower, whether they're facing to the left or to the right. Um, so I, I guess I don't really have an answer to your question. I think it's, I think it's a great topic for exploration, um, but it's going to require a team of data collectors looking at, I think, probably a specific location and trying to dissect that and, and put selfies into subgroups, including pictures of people taking pictures taking selfies. So. Um, because I think in some ways it's a comment on the act of taking a selfie. You right. Know? Um, so it's like using the older technology right. to take to comment on this new technology. And I mean, I think often in tourist sites, it's you know sort of a comment on the intrusiveness of the selfie, mm -hmm. maybe. Um, but at any rate, it just came to my mind. Yeah, it's there is such a profusion of images now. It really it's it's it's, it's overwhelming. Dizzy. It yeah. is dizzying. Yeah, yeah. and uh, it's even hard to get little handholds on it to try to figure out. What my point was basically that a lot of these things are not new. We have this right. new device in our hands, and we can use it uh, all all the time, every day. And some things may be new in one sense, but even the arty, the the taking your picture in front of you know a Picasso painting at MoMA, um, is not really all that different than the person who takes their picture in front of the pyramids so that they can show, not to show you what the pyramids look like, to show you that I'm somebody and I yeah. want to see the pyramids. So I think that's what that selfie is about. But it's a strange thing in a museum um, for so many visitors to be, you know, like if you've ever been in front of the Mona Lisa, uh, not that you can really see the Mona Lisa today, but the, you, there are hundreds of people with their cameras up and doing that. And um, I'm, not, uh, I'm, I'm not sure what to make of all that. Well, you've done a good job making a start. That's what I can say. You know, maybe you see it as a finish since you've come. I, I think it's going to be up to Bowdoin students of the next generation to look at this closely. Because undoubtedly, um, companies are, going to, are doing it all the time. For example, that um, Academy, I always thought that Academy Awards picture was, gosh, isn't Ellen DeGeneres creative? And there's Bradley Cooper just, you know, happened to be there and so on and so forth. Not so. It was all staged. Samsung, Samsung was the underwriter of the Academy Awards, and they, they created that selfie, you know, but it was. Oh, that's so interesting. And the same one with, um, um, Pop, uh, Big Poppy, um, when he went to the White House, do you remember when the Red Sox, back in the olden days, when they did win the pennant, um, and they went to the White House, and um, um, Pop, Big Poppy goes over to Barack Obama and says, can we take a selfie together? And pulls out his Samsung phone, and so there's Barack Obama with the Samsung phone, and they're taking a picture together, and that, that another, it's another Samsung moment. So. I guess what I'm saying is not to be so too cynical, but as I said, no, there's no images are accidental, and I think the the that many of the selfies also fall into that category. Maybe maybe there's room there for accidental selfies, but I don't know. But good question.
Thank you for your talk this afternoon. Thanks, Frank. Portraiture is obviously a huge topic, and wisely you have uh, framed this in an American context. But I wonder, in the course of doing research on this project, whether you haven't thought uh, more broadly about um, uh, portraiture and uh, new developments in this art form, if you will, uh, that extend beyond the United States, and whether there are surprising disruptions, uh, other creative usages uh, that are finding expression elsewhere. I, I'm sure there are. I mean, I have felt it, uh, you know, challenging enough to deal with the United States and try to make sense of this uh, um, over time. I mean, other people said, well, you know, well, where, where, where are Americans getting their ideas in the 18th century? Well, of course, they're coming from Great Britain. Are there other countries that have national portrait galleries, for example? There are really not that many. Um, and I have, uh, I have a son-in-law who's Nepali, and it's great to have conversations with him and to his sense of identity and a sense of place within a community is very different than um, a modern American sensibility about focus on the individual and the self and charging ahead. And I mean, just it's, there's a greater, I think, awareness for a larger group, which w um, w was uh, much more important to all of us maybe two centuries ago. But I think uh, today, I think particularly in the 20th century, a lot of people like Lionel Trilling have spoken about we tr kind of traded in our, our interest in group phenomena for the self, and we're self-driven. And I don't, you know, we're a model of self-driving people to the world. So it would be interesting, I think very interesting, to look at what's happening in some cultures that don't have a history of representational, you know, mimetic portraiture. But what, what is happening when you put cell phones in, in the hands of people like that? It, are, are there new dynamics? I would imagine there are. I just, I just don't know. But thank you for your wonderful talk. Um, I also want to congratulate uh, the curators on the title of this exhibit, especially the last part. If you say so, because when people go through that. Um, you know, is this a portrait, really? You know, and my question to you is, what are the challenges that observers will have, also based on the use of the word portraiture? You know, I looked up the definition of the word, and it includes, in many instances, uh, portraits in, in, or portrayals in, in text, in words. It's actually right. defined that way in, in, in dictionaries. I'm curious what your thoughts are well, on the I'm, I'm a Well, I'm a great advocate in a, for a very inclusive definition of portraiture, and that's why the title, to me, is kind of the epitome of, you know, what portraiture can and should be about. I think, unfortunately, for many decades, um, I mean, certainly when I began looking at, uh, you know, when I began my graduate career, uh, there was a, a very hi hierarchical attitude in our history about the definition of portraiture. And even back then, there was some debate as to, well, does, does photography really qualify? And I was all taken up by people who said, oh, well, painters and sculptors can reveal the character of the sitter. And uh, I, I, I write about this in, in the book that I did, that it's, it's just total total bogus. It's totally bogus that, you, you know, portraits can reveal many, many things about people, but they can't reveal your character. Um, so coming back to your question, though, about, well, you know, what do are, what are we, if the definition isn't clear, how can we make sense of what a, what really, what a portrait is? And I think it's going to take um, more people, scholars, focused on this subject to slowly, but over time, increase our awareness for all these images which may not have traditionally been thought of as portraits, but which are. And I think the fact that, that the artists, particularly the, the younger artists in this exhibition who are dealing with digital imagery and other kinds of phenomenon are going to help to break up this kind of rather um, stale and sterile uh, view of what defines a portrait. And I, I look at the National Portrait Gallery and think about, I think even the National Portrait Gallery, which it has as its major responsibility to acquire images of people who have been important to the history of America. Um, 
even their showing, doing exhibitions that are a little more freewheeling, I think are going to help people to, if, if, if 50 years from now you go into the National Portrait Gallery and it still looks the way it does today, then I think we've got a big problem because there'll be a disconnect between, well, wait a minute, I thought some people said that, you know, there, there are all these other things out here that be, can be called portraits, but, you know, they, they, don't, um, they don't look like portraits to me. The other thing I would say is that you can't overlook physiology in all of this. And the fact a number of people have written about humans being hardwired to look at faces and to see, see certain things in faces. Um, for example, um, there's a professor who I'm, I'm inviting to Middlebury next spring who teaches at the Harvard Medical School named Nancy Etkoff. And she wrote a book in the late 90s called Survival of the Prettiest. And it's about focus on youth culture and beauty and why um, you know, when you, get, when you get to be older, you may look back on it and think, well, why, why are people all focused on that? Well, a lot of it in reality is, um, relates to issues that we're hardwired to see. Like if um, in a, a pre-historical culture, uh, someone had a deformed face that didn't, wasn't symmetrical, you might not want to um, go off with that person because maybe that person was less likely to be able to give birth to children. Um, so I think there are things like that that we are we are conditioned to um, uh, to think about. So I think the issue for portraiture is that if their hardwiring is there, that we're always going to be want to be looking at faces anyway. Somehow that awareness happens has to be brought more fully into the picture so people understand that. Um, I don't know. It's it's pretty complex. Uh, but all I can say is that this exhibit has been a marvelous step in helping us to kind of expand this cosmology and to give us, make us more able to understand abstract portraits in the 20th century, which are in the in 21st century, which it's a really a marvelous age to be thinking about all this. So. Oh, I've got one quick question and one comment. Um, we just had a visiting artist in the printmaking studio um, over in Edwards, and she has a small exhibit in the gallery there. And one of her bodies of work is a series of etchings of people taking selfies in museums. Ah. So it kind of hits on all your topics. And she's, I think one of her interests is in how the identity of the person is obliterated by the selfie, because that's right. what's happening in some of the images. The light is actually taking the face away as ah. the selfie is taken. So, interesting use of a very old media to comment on a new media. That's great. I mean, I really do think it's kind of we're in the wild, wild west of understanding selfies, but they're not going away. Um, in fact, there are projections by people who project, you know, future technology and so on, who say we're going to go to uh, the what what's likely to happen is the still selfie is likely to go away and will be replaced by video, moving video selfies that, you know, we're going to be all doing almost all of that. Um, so. I have one more question, and I'm curious if you've observed this. I know a young artist who trained in New York City in one of the very traditional academies there to be a portrait painter and a realist painter, and he's barely out of his 20s. He's doing extremely well selling portraits to people in China and he travels back and forth, and predominantly they're of women, and they're posed very um, seductively, and they look like extremely traditional old yeah. portraits. There, there is an enormous market still for that. Um, there are companies that specialize in it in the United States. I wondered uh, what the attraction, how you might perceive the attraction for that I, type of portraits in that I, market. I, I don't know the, you know, the kind of middle class, upper middle class, um, market in China for, for realist portraits, but I'm guessing that, you know, they're seeing in other cultures, like uh, other cultures that they might identify with and admire, that, that is, that's, an important, that's an important aspect of their lives. So um, that d it's not surprising to me. There's still a lot of Americans who, who commission um, oil on canvas paintings, um, and they're not all people like Donald Trump and, uh, um, Jane and uh, Kit Forbes, but um, I, I, it, it just doesn't surprise me that, it, particularly in countries that are where the where the wealth is expanding and the number of people have access to, you know, other kinds of forms of consumer goods. And I would put the an oil painting in that context as a as a desirable consumer good. So.
Well, we're glad to have you back. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Um, if I'm correct, you've been at Middlebury for 31 years, and you were hired by a president who had been the Bowdoin Dean of Faculty at Middlebury. Mm -hmm. um, could you just tell us a bit about developing um, a college or university museum? Mm -hmm. Um, was there something we had here that he wanted there to uh, look favorably upon a Bowdoin alum uh, in the arts? How much of a concern is it to develop the museum more to become uh, a teaching museum rather than just a balanced and sort of famous museum? I, I, could, I could give a whole nother talk on this after, th after 30 years, but I won't. But I promise, it's 537, I know you people probably want to go elsewhere. Um, I'll just say a couple minutes. Yes, I, in going to Middlebury, I think uh, because I had been here as an undergraduate, I was familiar with Bowdoin, um, that he, he, he and he was familiar with Bowdoin and what Bowdoin had. Uh, and so he, he uh, Olin would have, Olin Robinson is his name, he would have said, um, as he said to me in his Texas accent, Richard, I don't understand much about the arts, but I know they're important. And that was one of the most wonderful things for someone to say, because what that meant was he had trust in what we were trying to do. And uh, so, yes, absolutely. I mean, Middlebury and Bowdoin are about the same age. Middlebury was founded in 1800, um, but never had an interest in the arts. And so what James Bowdoin III did by, by leaving this collection here was enormously important. Um, as everybody here knows that there were so few important college and university art collections in the 19th century. Um, and who has a Stanford, you know, white, McKim Mead White building in a, you know, the Patsy Chapel, you know, I mean, it's just, so this is, this was like an unbelievable model um, for lots of institutions. Um, and so, yes, I, I think he was incredibly supportive and it's been, a long sustained effort, and that's one of the reasons I stayed at Middlebury was because um, I have an unusual appointment where I'm both the director of the museum and a professor. I teach uh, regularly, and I believe wholeheartedly in that. And uh, yeah, there are big trade-offs when you do that, but um, th we are a teaching museum in the best sense of the word, just a, as the Bowdoin College Museum of Art is, in that we exist because the college exists, and. What's been happening, thanks to, I think originally with Andrew Mellon Foundation funding, were that a lot of colleges and universities were given funds and support to go beyond the art history curriculum and the studio art program and engage students across the, in the entire academic uh, arena. And that, there's nothing better than that. I mean, uh, I've taught some first year seminars at Middlebury and there, there's nothing better than having a group of students who've just arrived on campus and you know, have an opportunity to get them excited about the visual arts and the museum and use an art collection and exhibits and all of that to engage the, st the, cl the students. Um, so to me, that's, that, it doesn't get any better than that. I mean, I, I really wouldn't trade it. So, so yes, the answer is Bowdoin was a fantastic model for us. So thank you.